So good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. I, I'm uh, Christian Lutzernitz, uh, I'm senior lecturer in Tibetan and Buddhist art, and I'm welcoming you to this uh, second event in this kind of two talk uh, series on behalf of the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program, as well as the SOA Center. Uh, of Southeast Asian Studies seminar series uh, 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 led by Odomluk Honjokul this uh, year. Uh, this is the second event on artifacts, identities, and restitution that celebrates the first uh, or the publication of the first uh, volume in a joint uh, publication series between the Southeast Asian art academic program and uh, the National Universities of Singapore Press Public. And uh, it, uh, the book is edited by uh, Panga Adiansha and Louis Stillercott. And on the subject, Returning Southeast Asia's Past, Objects, Museums, and Restitutions. And yesterday, one of the editors uh, chaired the session. Today, it's the turn of uh, the second editor, my uh, former colleague, for, former and future colleague, <laughs> Louis Stithercott, uh, and also a co-investigator in the joint research project on Tibetan monastery collections. And uh, currently, uh, Louis Stithercott is the Wun Tai Chi professor in Asian art at Northumbria University. Uh, her research focuses on collecting and displaying Chinese uh, and Buddhist art in museums, and she has particular interest in issues around restitution and Asian material. So with this, I hand over the uh, word to her. I hope. Thank you very much, Christian, for that warm welcome. And thanks, everybody, for coming today and supporting this event. So a very warm welcome to this, uh, as, as Christian said, the second Southeast Asian Art Academic Programme or SARP uh, Research Seminar on Restitution. As Christian said, we had a session yesterday, a rather wonderful session on the politics of restitution, which was chaired by my co-editor, Panga Ardiancia. And uh, one of, it was notable that one of the speakers towards the end of that session, Jos, uh, noted that uh, yesterday's session was very much what he referred to as a man's affair uh, with four male speakers. And I'm really delighted to say that today um, it'll be what Jos referred to as a woman's affair in that we have three female speakers and, and myself. So in that sense, it's quite a contrast um, to yesterday's panel or manal, as they're sometimes referred to. So the title of today's session is Artifacts, Identities and Restitution. And unlike yesterday, where the two main speakers focused on Indonesia, and there was also a wonderful presentation on Cambodia, today we'll be looking at the situation of restitution in two countries in particular, Myanmar and Thailand. And I'm really delighted to be able to welcome and introduce our two speakers and also our discussant today. So our first speaker will be Dr. Charlotte Galloway, who is and an honorary associate professor at the Australian National University. Charlotte has extensive experience in the museum sector as a curator and registrar, and she was previously convener for the curatorial studies program at the National University, Australian National University. An Asian art historian with a specialist expertise in Myanmar, Charlotte has worked collaboratively with Myanmar Department of Archaeology and the National Museum on numerous projects. And in fact, she was the UNESCO expert for Bagan's World Heritage Listing. Charlotte is also an international member of ICOMOS Myanmar and an active researcher of the Myanmar arts and cultural heritage. And it, very importantly, she also contributed a wonderful chapter to our edited volume entitled Myanmar Museums and the Repatriation of Cultural Heritage. Our second speaker today is Pacha Pom Panomfan, or um, we refer to her as Pacha, um, who is a lecturer in medieval and economic history and, archae and an archaeologist at the University of Oxford. 
She's working on sustainable archaeological heritage development and community resilience against art crime. She's currently appointed as senior specialist for CTEP District Cultural Council, Pechabun province in Thailand. And importantly, she also contributed a, a rather wonderful chapter to our edited volume, um, and it was entitled Plybat, Reclaiming Heritage, Social Media and Modern Nationalism. And we're joined today by our discussant, who I'm sure is familiar to many of you, Undam La Huntraknal, who is a PhD candidate in History of Art and Archaeology at SOAS under the supervision of Professor Ashley Thompson. Her PhD research focuses on the Highland region between the Salween and Ping River basins and aims to understand political dynamics, social and cultural interaction between highlands and lowlands, the development of highland socio-political structure and political entities between the first millennial CE and the 15th century CE. She obtained her BA in archaeology from Sopocorn University. She has an MA in social development from Chiang Mai University, and of course, an MA in history of art and archaeology from SOAS. And in fact, prior to uh, starting her PhD at SOAS, she also taught archaeology, museum and heritage at the Faculty of Sociology and Anthropology at Tamasat University in Thailand. So welcome um, to all our speakers today. Before moving on and introducing Charlotte's uh, presentation, I thought I would just say that the overall uh, format, the structure for the session today will be the same as yesterday. Uh, we have two speakers, both presenting, I think, for around um, possibly 30 to 40 minutes uh, this time. And we also have a, a discussion, a final discussion with Om for 10 minutes or so. We will have time for questions from the audience after this, as we did yesterday. So please do make sure that you submit your questions into the Q&A box as we go along. And then we'll be coordinating uh, the discussion of these questions towards the end of the session. So in terms of Charlotte's talk then, um, her presentation is entitled Repatriation, Restitution and Myanmar. And she has written the following blurb about her talk. She says, Myanmar's more recent history has done little to support or protect the rich cultural heritage of the country. A troubled colonial rule, then a military regime, saw approaches to heritage management fall well behind international developments. In the last decade, during the transition to democracy, open engagement with contemporary approaches to protecting movable cultural heritage has not been possible. Repatriation of cultural heritage is now occurring, but this can be complex when considering Buddhist objects which were donations to temples or monasteries and have no clear chain of ownership. She says restitution may at times be an appropriate alternative, apart from the moral and legal arguments supporting repatriation or restitution, the current political situation brings, of course, yet more complexities to returning Myanmar's heritage. So thank you very much, Charlotte, and over to you. Thank you very much, Louise, and I will just share my screen and we trust that this will work as it did in our um, rehearsal. Now, slideshow for beginning. And display settings. And if you could just confirm that that is appearing appropriately for the everyone at the other end. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Sorry, can um, I just ask someone to respond? Yes, we can hear you, but we Thank can't you. see the PowerPoint yet. Oh, goodness. You just need to do share screen on the Zoom window, I think. Yes, I think that's, I did exactly what we did last time, but it obviously hasn't worked, sorry. Uh, here we go. And sorry about that, we did this last time and it didn't, and it did work. Mm -hmm. I've got 
one good way of fixing this. Now, this I know will work. Ah, uh, where we go. My apologies and from beginning. Okay, now they're going to tell me that is correct. <laughs> we still can't see it. <laughs> not kidding. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you... That's uh, ridiculous. All go, right. Go on the Zoom page and click on share screen first. Yep, I'll just close that. There and we go. Then find the PowerPoint uh, window from, from the options. Yes, now we see it. Now we see All it. Right. Thank you. All right, new slideshow. Oh, slideshow from beginning. That's all right now. Thank you. Good. Well, apologies for that first few little hiccups. Maybe it is um, time of day on a Friday after, um, evening here in um, Canberra. Um, as is customary, I'm, um, as I'm um, giving my academic presentation, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently um, placed, the Ngunnawal and um, Nambri people, and um, pay tribute and respect to their elders past, present and emerging. It is certainly a pleasure to be able to present today and I thank very much um, Pengar for the inv invitation and to the organisers of um, this series. Um, repatriation of my work in Myanmar, um, you know, repatriation of cultural heritage to countries for which for the most part have had such objects removed either during colonial rule or being illegally exported for financial gain is without doubt a meritorious act. And when I'm thinking about um, activities in Myanmar, of course, this act of merit very much comes to mind um, with Myanmar being um, such a predominantly um, Buddhist uh, country. But I do wonder how meritorious these acts may be. I'm delivering my talk today very conscious of my role as an outsider, the Western art historian and heritage professional who sees benefits in writing past wrongs and applauding the international treaties established principally by representative bodies of countries who were in positions of global power. My role as outsider is all the more obvious in light of the current events in Myanmar, which see many of my colleagues yet again unable to participate freely in international forums, reliant on others to hopefully convey their views and opinions. And with this in mind, I make clear here that my presentation draws on my own observations and experiences um, researching in Myanmar for over 20 years and my work with the Department of Archaeology and Museum. I've been fortunate to have collaborated with Myanmar colleagues on numerous museum and heritage projects. And I do pause for thought here, as I know we all care for the safety of our fellow academics and friends. Today, in focusing on the repatriation of objects to Myanmar, it is like everything about Myanmar, a complex issue. And I really can only touch on some points here. When researching for the book chapter in Louise and Pangar's timely and important publication, I really did become very curious um, as to why Myanmar had not been more proactive to repatriation of cultural heritage. There are numerous objects in international um, public collections that have clear uh, pro um, provenance histories, um, which would suggest that these objects are, you know, have been taken from Myanmar in the past illegally. Um, and quite, it would have been quite likely that in the current international museum environment, that any approaches made to governments for their return would be viewed favorably. In this process, it brought to my mind some issues though, which had also been trouble, troubling me a little while working, well, troubling me a lot really, while working on capacity building with Myanmar's museum environment. And namely, it's the fundamental issue of what is cultural heritage in Myanmar. Do the objects that I have been trained to believe are exemplars of Myanmar's cultural history and Western art, um, art historical paradigms of the same assumed importance to the Burmese? And I don't think I've ever had or heard a discussion about local priorities in this regard. 
And yet this is fundamental to progressing repatriation or addressing any discussions about repatriation or restitution to Myanmar. Understanding what the local attitudes are towards repatriation and perhaps considering that repatriations uh, or reparations might be more appropriate in some cases. Um, whether indeed, you know, is this even of particular interest um, to Myanmar? You know, other issues, of course, is, you know, who do we give back objects to? And what do we do now um, with the Myanmar experience, its military coup? And I'll talk a little bit about some uh, very real time um, example um, at the end of my presentation. So just starting with what is heritage in Myanmar? Um, there has always been for me a very clear um, difference between how many of us in Western societies view our heritage and our museum collections and how those in non-Western countries may view their material heritage. I've grown up in an environment where we treat our objects and museums with a degree of reverence. We have a great attachment to objects of the past. Um, but observing how my colleagues in Myanmar even physically interact with objects and in discussions about them, you know, sometimes with what, you know, of how you manage museums and objects, um, objects in museum collections, it's very clear to me that our relationship with things is and what they symbolize is very different and um, between our two cultures. And often handling, and when you're trying to engage with workshops and so on in museum practices, you know, handling can often be, I watch them, it's no different just to picking up a dish and taking it to the table. So the experience we have with actual objects is quite different between these um, cultures. So before embarking on any sort of widespread um, spread, um, repatriation, we need to understand what cultural heritage is in this Myanmar context. And if we don't share or understand these differences, our value judgments will result in conflicting goals and approaches, and even potentially unwelcomed or unnecessary returns of movable cultural artifacts. And central to this probably is that repatriation itself is a Western construct which developed principally within government and museum frameworks. And how does a country engage in these frameworks and structures um, if they haven't had them very long themselves? And I believe this is a very important point um, when considering Myanmar. And we often forget how new Western um, concepts of heritage and museums are within the country. I've just put up here a very brief sort of recent history of Myanmar on our slide, the slide. You know, they became part of the British Empire um, from as early as 1852, but were full, um, was full colonial rule from 1886. Um, we had World War II, then independence um, in 1948, a military coup in 62, first um, open elections in 2010, then again, um, full open elections in 2015 again in 2020, but then again, we've had now a military coup on the day the new government was meant to be um, sworn in. So it's actually been a very disruptive recent history at the same time, if we think about what's happening in museum developments um, around the world, um, this has been a very um, unfortunate environment and background for that to um, develop um, in um, parallel. So when we actually have a look at some of the uh, museum, Myanmar's museum history in brief, and I think this is important in understanding the role of you know, how restitution or repatriation issues um, fit in here. Um, one probably key thing is that the British actually established many significant museums throughout this part of the British Empire. And yet there was never a government funded major museum built in Myanmar during colonial rule. The first museum established was the um, Independent Fair um, Provincial uh, Museum, which opened in Yangon in 1867, um, named after Arthur Fair, the British Chief Commissioner. Um, it comprised his own collection. And this is an interesting point in itself, as the, the time, of course, colonizers saw their collecting as a, a right in line with sort of spoils of war, um, or even just being you know, part of an empire that objects could be collected um, quite happily without any um, idea that these were being taken. 
Even in 1892, Ertel, an engineer with the British and Indian government, was tasked on reporting on local architecture, noted um, the condition of the Fair Museum building and remarked, and um, I quote, there's the chief city of the only Indo-Chinese country under British rule. Rangoon should have a particularly good museum, end of quote. But why was there no major public museum in Yangon? And in really the complexities of colonial rule answer this question in part. And suffice to say here, I think most of us appreciate that the British Burmese colonial um, interactions was rather an, an unhappy one. The British, as I mentioned, had established major museums throughout um, in India, Sri Lanka, modern day Pakistan and Bangladesh. And history has shown that much of the collections in these museums remained in place at the end of colonial rule. So that was a relatively fortunate outcome that was not afforded in Myanmar. Without a single museum as a central repository for cultural heritage, it was difficult to control the export of Burmese art. And as Ertel also noted, even in the late 1800s, many of the precious antiquities were fast being lost or removed from the country. It was only in 1952, four years after independence, that a National Library Museum and Art Gallery was opened um, and, and it was called the Cultural Institute. And the aim of the Institute um, was, and I quote, to strengthen the national unity of Burma by raising the cultural level of the people, to bring history to life and to create an awareness of the cultural heritage of the past. Um, and this was, um, so what was that cultural heritage? I'll just put up a couple of slides here while I'm talking too, um, just as some of the early museums, there were some um, early sort of museums um, created in Myanmar, but they were um, associated really with the archeological de um, departments. And uh, of course that was run by the British at the time. And there were small um, regional museums like this one at Bagan, which um, housed artifacts um, from the site. Um, so what was, as I mentioned, this cultural heritage that was referred to um, in the official government reports of 1953? Well, in 1958, a paper by the then director of the Archaeological Survey of Burma, Yulu Pei Win, listed aspects of Burmese culture which endured throughout the period of colonial rule and were considered of importance to Burmese identity. These included religious architecture, civil architecture, painting, lacquerware, silver and gold work, weaving, language and literature, drama, astrology, weights and measures, coinage and festivals. Um, and I note there the absence of reference to um, particularly Buddhist sculpture um, and other Buddhist um, artifacts. Um, but I've included this quote um, as it is about Burmese perception of their culture. And yet when we discuss Burma, Burmese cultural heritage, we inevitably return to Buddhism as almost all of the historic artifacts that have survived are connected to Buddhism and the act of dana or donation. Myanmar's engagement with international museum trends in those early years post-independence um, was rapid. They were signatories to a number of international um, conventions and they ratified um, the UNESCO protocol for protection of cultural property, the 1954 convention and the um, protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict um, was ratified also in 1956. UNESCO was active in supporting Myanmar's museum development, um, providing staff training for staff. Um, the Myanmar passed the 1957 Antiquities Act um, though this also, um, interestingly, allowed the director of archaeology to remove any object from its original location if it was deemed to be at risk. And it is probably this clause that has enabled so many objects to be removed um, under the guise of safekeeping during the ensuing decades of military rule and to be traded to foreign markets. The main aim, of course, um, being to attain hard currency, particularly during periods of international sanctions. There was even a museum week held in 1961 to mark the ninth anniversary of the National Museum and National Art Gallery. Regional cultural museums were established in major centres such as Pa'an and Taonji, and cultural activities were actively promoted. However, this was as far as Myanmar would get in meaningfully engaging with the heritage sector for nearly 50 years. The 1962 coup cut short Myanmar's rapid advancement and the country's evident potential was quashed. 
under Ne Wins Berman's Socialist Program Party Rule, management of regional cultural museums was transferred to the Ministry of Culture in 1972, and the collections were also nationalised. Um, one, there was, um, we know there was a period then of um, quite, um, of uh, separation really from inter any international engagement. But when um, the restrictions to foreign aid were relaxed in the early um, uh, 1980s, there was a brief flurry of international engagement again, which resulted in experts being brought in to Bagan, in particular to map its monuments. However, um, after the 1988 uprising, which led to Ne Win's um, resignation and power being seized by, um, seized by the State Law and Order Restoration Council, or SLORC, this really marked the beginning of a period of extreme suppression again and further stagnation of the arts and heritage sectors. The SLORC really took over heritage. It built grand cultural edifices, including the new National Museum in Yangon, which opened in 1996, and the preposterously large Bagan Archaeological Museum in the middle of the archaeological zone at Bagan, um, at the same time building this as they were submitting Bagan for its um, unsuccessful World Heritage listing in the mid 1990s. Yet once completed, um, the museums basically were stagnated. People didn't visit, there were people in charge, um, did not have any training. Um, and it was really not until the transition to democracy um, from 2008 that true international engagement was reinvigorated. And since then, through to um, February the 1st, 2021, the museums and heritage sector has experienced significant growth and modernization, thanks to government support and international um, uh, accepting international donor funding to provide um, staff and training for capacity building. And I note here, you know, this was Myanmar's first children museum opened in 2017. And that was down in, um, in large part to the um, then director of the museum at Bagan, um, who had also benefited from, from training and um, so on during this period. Um, Myanmar also signed numerous um, the additional treaties um, in 2013, um, means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export and transfer of ownership of cultural properties, um, and also the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage was ratified in 2014. The National Museum in Naypyidaw was opened in 2015. Um, and of course, we're familiar with the two major exhibitions held in the US, which um, had loans from um, Myanmar, which was the first time that Myanmar had engaged with international um, museums and um, exhibitions. Um, Myanmar was also admitted as a member of ICOM in the late two, in 2016, and Myanmar ICOMOS was formed in 2017. So there was a real connection there with international museum professionals. Um, and the government also then, and I say here, re-engaged with repatriation. So in spite of some of those more negative comments about the early period of colonial rule, um, when Myanmar gained uh, independence um, in 1948, the first act of voluntary repatriation was authorized and this was um, done by the British government. Um, King Thibaw's Lion Throne, taken from Mandalay Palace to the um, Indian Museum in Kolkata um, in 1902, was returned um, under the direction of um, Lord Louis Mountbatten um, while he was Viceroy of India. And this was the first official act of heritage repatriation um, to Myanmar. It was a symbolic act um, and a token um, in a way for years of colonial rule. And even though the monarchy would not be re-established, the Lion Throne was a powerful representation of Myanmar's um, independent and proud past. Other acts of repatriation followed. Um, in 1956, um, a treasure chest of Queen Supayalat was returned from the UK, and this ivory chair from the Mandalay Palace was presented. And I love reading some of these old um, books because we've we sort of have these teasers of I'd love to know more about these people who um, and how they came in possession of these objects and obviously that's something for further research. Um, but this chair, which is now in the um, collection of the National Museum in Yangon and on display, um, Messrs Ogden and Sons, jewellers of Harrogate in London. This was received through the Burmese Embassy in London. Um, there was also the return of these pair of Lokapala Nats 
um, which were from Kung Thibor's palace in Mandalay. And these were presented by a wing commander, uh, Martin, who from Queen's Gate in London. And these um, um, in, figures actually flank the lion throne today in the National Museum in Yangon. And you can see them on the edge of um, the um, screen at the, at the image. So other um, objects were gifted, um, a gilded Buddha from the palace at Ava, donated by a Mrs. Ride, daughter of the late Captain Barwick of Folkestone, UK. Um, there was also an old uh, Mon Bill was sent back from Calcutta, um, which apparently had valuable informative inscriptions. In 1959, the Ministry of Culture report states that Prime Minister Unu formally requested the return of historic Burmese weapons, then housed at Fort William, Kolkata, um, which the British had taken from Burma at the end of the Third Anglo-Burmese War, and these were returned. Um, these were indeed returned. But apart from these examples, um, these repatriation requests were very much associated with the colonial history in Myanmar, even though we do know that there were a number of significant cultural objects removed by other Western nations. Um, perhaps the best known case concerning friezes and um, frescoes and tiles taken from Bagan um, by German treasure hunter um, Thomas Thoman around 1899. The works are well documented, um, but no attempts have been made to um, repatriate these objects. But if we move forward to the post 2010 period, the music, as I mentioned, the museum sector has advanced rapidly and there have been public acts of repatriation and each raises different issues. In 2013, a Bagan period Buddha was returned from the US. The process had started in 1988 when the upper two thirds of the statue was stolen from Bagan and advertised for sale at Sotheby's um, in 1991. And after many years of persistent um, legal investigation and scholarly involvement by staff at the Burma Studies Centre at um, Illinois University, it was returned and reunited with the lower third of the statue, which was still in Myanmar. This sculpture is now on display in the National Museum, along with this plaque that tells you the story. Um, and um, it's just an example of this display and it's nice new, newly renovated um, spaces. However, this case um, did actually highlight some of the political factors which affect reparation um, here. The time taken to resolve this case was affected by the US's sanctions um, on Myanmar, which prohibited any progression of repatriation, even in spite of international um, laws which facilitated um, this return. In July 2017, there were two further cases of repatriation. And the first involved a New Zealand family who decided to return a small group of objects taken by their ancestors in 1852 during the Second Anglo-Burmese War from the Shwemodor Pagoda at Bago. The provenance was well known to the family members um, and the current custodians were not comfortable with the history of these objects, a situation prompted by changing attitudes towards the colonial periods and actions of the colonizers. For the family in press interviews, they position themselves as caretakers, acknowledging that at the time, taking souvenirs from battle areas by conquering troops was not really viewed as inappropriate behavior. And returning the objects was seen as what we call restorative justice. However, in a discussion on the moral arguments for repatriation, philosopher Karen Bjornberg argues that returning the physical object may not be the most appropriate means of compensation in these cases. In returning the objects to Myanmar, how has this enhanced Myanmar's cultural history? And how does the return in any way right past wrongs? In this example, um, perhaps a financial donation to the pagoda for support of local charities or commissioning of a new Buddha image for donation may have been in a way a more appropriate or um, popular action. The same month, the Norwegian government returned a 200 year old Buddha image and the statue was seized by custom officials in 2011. And while details of the case are not well known, it appears the statue was exported to Norway via Thailand and the Buddha image was returned to Myanmar and handed over at a ceremony at the museum in Napidor. And this was a textbook case though of international agencies working together, utilizing the legislative frameworks of international law and conventions. 
However, Myanmar was not necessarily really part of this. This was part of Norway deciding this object, picking up this object as something that was likely to be illegally imported, contacting the Myanmar government and then working through that process of re um, uh, returning the object. Myanmar also introduced their own um, a new antiquities law in 2015, um, which is the protection and preservation of antique objects law. Um, and any object that's over 100 years of, old, um, of age, whether made in Myanmar or made in a foreign country and has been in Myanmar for 100 years is um, included in this. And while it's positive to see this law enacted, there are aspects of it which may in fact um, discourage repatriation. If a Burmese national, for example, or anybody buys an object overseas of Burmese origin that might be over 100 years old, if you actually want to take that back to Myanmar, you may be deemed to be in breach of the law because you're in possession of an object which is over 100 years of age. Um, and there is no case law yet um, to try um, to test this in Myanmar, but it has been discussed um, as causing quite a few difficulties, potential difficulties. The law does in fact reference repatriation and includes a clause that actually states that the um, government in Myanmar could request the antique objects of Myanmar origin, which are in foreign countries, which indicates a good awareness of the process of um, repatriation. Myanmar is well placed to proceed with repatriation requests. And while there may have been a valid argument in the past to query Myanmar's ability to safeguard repatriated items, um, their museum systems are now fairly, have been fairly robust, and there's a reasonable degree of transparency in most aspects of their museum um, activities. Um, however, um, no actions have yet been taken. And this brings me back to the issue of importance. Sorry, I'll just move um, through that. Um, to the issue of, you know, what, what objects are of significance um, to people in Myanmar? Um, and objects that are no longer there, what purpose may repa um, repatriation serve? Particularly as Myanmar's cultural heritage is primarily associated with Buddhism. As I mentioned, um, Buddhism in Myanmar is characterized by the practice of donation with a donor earning merit. And underpinning Buddhist philosophy is the goal of enlightenment, which will bring with it a release from suffering. And of course, one of the causes of suffering is attachment. This extends to all things, whether living or inanimate, and it is readily seen how this foundational belief is at odds with placing nostalgic value on objects linked with the past. Buddhist cycles of rebirth encourage renewal. Family heirlooms, often seen in Western culture as a link between past, present and future, do not always have the same role in Myanmar culture. Yes, there are objects associated with ritual tradition, but the objects themselves are often subject to renewal. And of course, merit is earned through the donation, not necessarily the maintenance of a particular object. And if an object is damaged, a new one will often take its place. Another factor which colors Myanmar's attitudes to objects is their association with particular events. Karmatic Buddhism um, melds with local indigenous nat spirit or spirit worship. And this tradition um, in spirits um, need to be appeased as they can be male malevolent. Both Buddhist and Nat traditions discourage an attachment to objects that are linked to misfortune. And if bad luck befalls a family, others are unlikely to want to possess their property as it becomes tainted with um, this misfortune. And this applies across all levels of society. Even in Burmese monarchy, um, there was evidence of frequent moving of capitals and rebuilding of, um, of even of thrones, um, depending on the circumstances behind the new king come, um, position of um, uh, coming into um, become king. So to this end, do objects you know that have left the country somehow become lost um, to the Burmese, and this attachment no longer necessarily remains, and its significance may not necessarily be interpreted the same way that um, others um, in different cultures may do so. Another complicating factor for repatriation within the Buddhist context is the concept of ownership. Um, lawyer Nazima Kamadin, in an article addressing Sri Lanka and the cultural heritage and cultural heritage, 
in a discussion about the bronze image of the goddess Tara in the British Museum collection. She outlines um, key legal issues relating to ownership when Western law meets the East and notes that under Buddhist tradition um, in Sri Lanka, while the king owns all his kingdom, he is only a custodian or guardian. Gregory Chopin, who's an expert on Buddhist traditions, has also addressed the role of ownership in Buddhism. You know, who does own the objects that are donated to temples and monasteries? Is there a clear legal chain of ownership between objects gifted to the Buddha, who does not exist in a legal sense, um, and custodians of a temple where the objects may have originally resided? And again, no case law has been established in this area. One factor that may promote the government to engage in repatriation um, in Myanmar is its role in heritage diplomacy, a strategy that it's increasingly recognized as part of um, the diplomatic repertoire. With repatriation of cultural heritage, the gestures may come at little real cost, but can deliver significant benefits in terms of inter-country relations. And this is an area which could be exploit, exploited by um, both um, foreign countries and Myanmar itself. However, in light of current situation in Myanmar, acts of repatriation will halt. While um, an object might be part of a country's heritage, who is the legitimate custodian? Who are we going to return anything to at the moment? And would this be legitimizing the role of the current um, military um, regime? We also might even return to the question here of are museum collections safe? And how do we keep on ensuring, you know, building of any sort of trust between um, people who are wishing to repatriate objects um, to Myanmar in this current situation? Which brings me actually to one, my concluding just a little anecdote here. I was actually directly involved in putting um, a, a person in Australia who was wanting to return a large Kaliga, and this is just an example that's actually in the Australian Nas National Gallery of Australia's collection. Um, it's not the work in Quit that I'm talking about. Um, and this uh, woman, they should collected this Kaliga in Thailand in the 1960s, which is not an uncommon story. It's a really fabulous work. Um, we had got to the point where we had contact, I'd contacted the um, National Museum in Napidor and the Director General of Archaeology and they'd confirmed that they would really love to see this piece returned to Myanmar. And it was literally on the 2nd of February I was going to ring the ambassador the day after the government had been sworn in to um, um, arrange these connections and of course the Myanmar coup happened. In speaking to the potential donor we of course it's there's no way we're going you know anything is going to go back to the country now. Even though the ownership of this object might relate much more broadly to the military regime, anything we give back is being, would be seen at this current time. It could be lead, used for political purposes, but also could be seen as giving some legitimacy to the people in power. So this idea of ownership and um, repatriation, it's a really is living sort of happening example in Myanmar at the present. There is certainly much more that can be said about repatriation and reparations um, in Myanmar, in the complexities of their heritage. There is still much we don't understand. They said even understanding and appreciating and identifying what heritage means um, to the people in Myanmar still is something we need to really do. So, and while uncertain, I, all I can say in um, conclusion here, in keeping with Myanmar's history and everything Myanmar, it is complicated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for a, a wonderfully um, wide ranging and illuminating um, presentation, which really highlights the, the sheer complexity of the situation, the very specific issues that arise in, um, in terms of restitution to, to Myanmar. And you raise all sorts of really important issues that I'm, I'm sure we can come back to later in the, in the discussion. So uh, just before I move on to, um, pre uh, to present Patches, uh, to, to introduce Patches' presentation, just a, a quick reminder to the audience to please put your questions into the Q&A box as we go along and we'll be looking at these towards the end.
So we're going to turn now to Patrick's presentation, which is a uh, pre-recorded talk. It'll last um, around 40 minutes or so. Unfortunately, Patcha has not been able to present to us live today. She's been in a, very sadly, she's been in a road accident. But heroically, she says she will be available for the discussion afterwards, for the Q&A discussion afterwards, but she may not be able to turn her camera on. So the title of Patcha's talk today is Plybats, Reclaiming Heritage, Social Media and Modern Nationalism. And her blurb for her presentation, she writes that um, she will look closely at contemporary repatriation requests for objects looted from uh, Plybat in Thailand, presently displayed in museums in the West. Her talk will trace recent developments in the repatriation issue where local activism and social media have shifted the balance for a more democratizing process of restitution forwarded by the state government. And it was the establishment of Sam Nook Sam Roy Ong, uh, excuse my, my pronunciation here, um, in Thailand by a local group, by a group of local historians, which has generated a grassroots movement for advancing local and communal cultural identity in relation to the objects requested for return. And since heritage is considered an embodiment of a glorious past, Local heritage ownership is an important aspiration for localized political, social, and economic developments, particularly those located in the peripheral regions, such as Northeastern Thailand. Social media thus provides a powerful platform, she argues, for local communities to bolster the quest for repatriating and owning artifacts. Thank you very much, Patcha, and over to your presentation. Good morning. Um, I would like to start my talk off by thanking the um, Luz and Panga for this wonderful opportunity to participate in this project and um, the SOAS for organizing this talk and the NUS Publication House for um, enabling this project to happen. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, essentially about how social movement uh, has transformed our interaction with um, the wider audience, particularly people who live on heritage sites, uh, which is my primary interest on how to make these communities more resilient to activities in art, crime and um, restitutions and awareness of heritage plays a large part into that. And the internet for the past two decades have now become a focal point in how these communities ends up defining and interacting with uh, historical objects and heritage in both within their community, outside the community, nationally and internationally. So internet activism began in the early 2000s. Uh, with the development of the web and social media platform, there were substantially lower costs associated to participating in social movements and mobility. You think about it in the 1980s, you need to phone call people, you need to print things, you need to battle for newspaper, you need manpower um, to kind of mobilize everyone or, and deliver uh, ideas related to, to social movement. Um, now it's entirely possible to, uh, you don't have to pay or fight for that type of um, pl uh, platform that way. Uh, and it can immediately reach a lot of people depending on access, scope and use, usage and interactions. Now with the development of that benefit, obviously there were optimists and skeptics. Uh, some people think of social movements on in the internet as you know, opportunities to expand meaningful uh, connections, increase uh, democratizes uh, opportunities to generate 
generate any type of movement, um, help movement emerge uh, and mobilize. So that's kind of the optimistic hypothesis. But at the same time, there were observations emerging at the same time that you know this could really be um, socially isolating and unsustainable. Uh, if you think about it, if you choose to engage or create a Facebook group, it would be only people within your social network it could be friends, friends of friends and friends of friends. And it stops that. <laughs> Normally, it's very hard for our internet to build up massive crowds um, and sustain that particular crowd interest. So that their criticism has built up to observations that um, these kind of internet activism might just be micro mobilization and has um, not so far shown real sustaining uh, real world impact um, world impact as when we compare it to kind of the the hard driven physical um, material uh, social movement in the past now, when we look at the internet, it's also important to kind of step back and try to understand how the internet and heritage interacts. With that way of interaction, it means it also reshapes by putting heritage onto the internet itself, reshapes how we interact with heritage. While it may widen access for usage and interaction, um, helps. Uh, it allows us to visit historical parks in terms um, in times of national and international lockdowns. Now it's possible to travel to these places, but at the same time, uh, with access to that type of information, uh, debates such as ownership of you know these modeling uh, the data on these heritage becomes contentious uh, debates. Who owns it? Who benefits from it? Who has access to it? Uh, and in what language and language barrier emerges out of that also? Um, and you have uh, issues like transforming symbolism, how, how things that were once defined as heritage are uh, being used in multiple different ways. It's now possible uh, to visit historical parks, find YouTubers videos, and each and one of those YouTube videos talking about different historical sites or visiting different sites will transform the meaning of heritage or the receiver uh, perception of it. Um, now, while this is all great and uh, comes with a lot of uh, kind of open ground for for thinking about how internet interacts with heritage, it also leaves room for much of a larger grey market and grey area that we don't understand. Now, the cons of this type of uh, kind of open space, from what we've seen in the last two decades, is definitely the rise in antiquities trafficking. And it comes with a set of things. It's not just straight selling, vending in traditional market settings that you used to see in the past. It also brought about a lot of exchange of information within the people trading antiquities. Um, and that allows inter individuals to step from being career academics or non-career academics into the realm of public figures and public intellectuals. Um, people who within that particular uh, network, uh, web network, uh, claim expertise. And these are usually the people who operate uh, pages or content online. Um, and obviously, when you're interacting with a large area, there's, there's that problem of um, kind of an echo chamber where you don't really get kind of information editing, uh, kind of exchange, the real uh, kind of checks and checks that usually happens with information. Um, and it slips to, to benefit, unfortunately, uh, some destructions of heritage sites. So... With that in mind, um, I'm going to walk you us through this bigger question on what does it mean for interactions with repatriation and restitution, which is the focus of my chapter in the book. Um, first of all, when we think about the internet uh, within the scope uh, of what we're talking about, and in this case, I'll be talking about flybot. We have to first start 
drawing where the boundaries are and the boundaries in this discussion are shapes that particular interaction Blybot is a movement that started on Facebook it's a social media platform uh, movement um, so it's also limited to the population that has access to that particular social media network or the individuals who have set up the page and raised a campaign on it now <clears throat> that brings about some very interesting aspects on how this uh, movement was driven because it's so when it's social media it also immediately means that it's dependent on uh, the group of people and scaling from groups of people that these individuals know or are affiliated to that also subjects in how information transfer and information uh, procurement or information translation then becomes part of that larger movement, um, this network of, of boundaries to the web. Um, there's that, that aspect of information delivery that comes into that kind of the scope for how these interactions happen. So as we go into the story of Blybot, uh, uh, emerge, there emerge a um, extensive kind of conflicting uh, interests nuances, um, tensions within the, the story itself. Um, and at the same time, it also unravels uh, the way objects, the story of how objects leave places in um, its origin, uh, you no know, location, leaves that location, interacts with the local academics, interact with the local population and enters the international uh, uh, waters uh, and eventually reaches the hands of curators and writers who then proceed to write about them. Um, and then that information feeding right back into the hands of uh, the locals uh, 40 years later, uh, on uh, re for repatriation. So we start the story off with uh, kind of explaining a Brakwon Chai Horde. So Bai Bat or Brakwon Chai Horde is associated to craftsmanship school, which I'm going to flag that as contention, uh, part of a larger kind of information debate that went on to understanding how um, this interaction of leaving and problematic, how it highlights problematic aspects of how we interact with heritage uh, in a sense, right? And it's it's a series of, of sculptures, essentially. Uh, it's category given to a sculpture that appeared in the Korat Plateau between the 7th and the 9th century. So it's associated to the sculptures you see on the left, uh, they're bronzes, um, Avalokiteshvara bronzes, and um, the, they were discovered sometime between 1961 and 1965. Now, during that time, there was a regional conflict that drove extensive looting. Um, development in economic development conditions in the area were conducive. Uh, looting was done both as complementary added income. Um, and also, at the same time, it's, um, it's also uh, done out of subsistence uh, needs. Uh, dealers would go in uh, who were affiliated to um, large uh, the trading and powerful figure network, um, international military network that were in operating in that area um, that were also collecting, transporting and uh, gathering uh, these cultural um, material culture in the area for both study and collection purposes. So there was quite a bit of a growing interest in Southeast Asia demand um, at that time and that drove kind of these objects leaving the place. Um, so Bybot is one of those uh, very dramatic cases where looting extended it to a point where a report was written in 1964 where two Bybot, two temple, the temple above that you see, allegedly where the sculpture, most of the sculptures came from, uh, was blasted with dynamite mites. So <clears throat> that was how bad this was uh, because locals were continuously looking for stuff and they thought things were 
in parts of the buildings and roofing there might be secret chambers so it got blown up um and the other reason it got blown up uh i will highlight later on has to do with kind of the heritage management aspect back then and still very much a problem uh and tension that we see developing in this particular case but um, immediately after they were looted from the site, um, they were they were designed to, to leave the country. So they were taken to uh, areas around Pimai and then smuggled out eventually uh, via the uh, port in, in areas in Dantaburi. Now, problem, um, some of the hordes were intercepted by local authorities. Um, in the process of preventing a district uh, chief was shot dead uh, t uh, by looters uh, who, who were transporting out uh, large sculptures, uh, which uh, fortunately were later on intercepted and now uh, remains at the Bangkok National Museum. So that allowed the local authorities to kind of conclude uh, that these objects came from areas around Bui Ram with uh, the arrest of the individuals involved in that one single um, smuggling. And that was the information level that they, they had, at least officially. Uh, and then suddenly a lot of other stuff uh, that left the country uh, ended up appearing on the international market. But for most of its time, the debate on its provenance became a tension for many publications. So once it left Thailand, uh, it be immediately became very interesting sets of objects, which then entered kind of into, I won't get into the discussion on whether they're real or they're not, they're copies, they're forgeries, or uh, they could be pastiche of, of something else or another. But the discussion here is how the system handles uh, and interacted with these objects in terms of publications that were coming out at that time. Now. The objects were treated as art and archaeological objects that were studied removed from context. So discussions were on its art style, its significance to religions move, historical religious movement that happened around the 79th century, uh, different materials that were made in, kind of the aesthetics of the individual sculptures itself, without much talk on the original site. It wasn't until 1975 and that a series of photographs were, were given by to by an art dealer, um, a name art dealer, to a curator at a museum in Denver, Emma Bunker, who then proceeded to um, publish an article revealing that uh, the sculptures itself came from Blybat uh, area uh, temple. Now, uh, Blybat isn't the only case of kind of this hype in interest in. Uh, art and archaeology that drove this scope um, and idea of studying objects and publishing on objects based on cataloging publication, identifying certain places and just writing on its aesthetics and pieces without uh, knowing the object's provenance. Uh, so this is kind of the pre-processual um, archaeology kind of movement emerge. Uh, but and it's still kind of going on um, in both kind of professional publication to amateur uh, um, historian archaeologist publication to um, people working in private museums. This type of publications of cataloging, uh, talking about about uh, the shapes and forms and, and functions of the objects without really focusing or scoping uh, on a particular location, where manner it was found, where it was discovered, uh, but link it loosely to the scope of pre Angkorian Bravati, uh, larger uh, area. Now, when Emma published this, she made an argument. Of course, obviously, she was attacked for for working uh, with an art dealer to procure those information. But some of the rebuttals surrounding um, Emma Bunker's publication 
uh, defended us on call all that, that she was saving uh, these sculptures and information surrounding these sculptures. Otherwise, uh, these information would have been lost. Now, um, Brew have come out to uh, uh, critique uh, narratives, not necessarily Emma, but a wider series of scholarship that uh, emerged before the 2000s. This kind of of uh, writing purely on the objects itself, uh, removing it from its its kind of provenance as uh, rescued narrators. And in that, that kind of critique is that rescue narratives in the end serves no uh, real kind of contextual build up. Instead, what it does is that it ends up providing uh, legitimization for identifying um, that are good enough for the art trade, but rarely building concretely to historical larger narratives. Um, and it was kind of further that um, by having these kind of, of identification, catalogues, publication, what ends up happening is um, the academics then put themselves into a condition where they become congenial bedfellows, people who actually help bolster sales, auctions, and exchanges of, uh, of these uh, antiquities trade, which may have left the country of origin or the place in um, illegal or at least uh, in modern terms, legal framework, uh, wrong manner, uh, illegal manners. And we see this, that the more publication verifies when the Freibat Prakun Chai hoard started emerging, uh, the attention, the discussion, uh, before uh, a lot of publication came out about it, uh, prices, that's because of the debate, people didn't know where it was from, uh, prices weren't high. And with more kind of exhibits, pieces, cataloging, publication, that immediately led to huge escalation in prices, with uh, prices going between 40,000 and 60,000. And this is kind of contemporary uh, counting in 2008 to up until to 250,000 and to 350,000 um, in 2015. And the prices are still for these objects. So, why were looting so easy? Uh, that brings into to this question, what happens to when we, we start leaving at this provenance, this idea of context behind, it leaves a lot of story of how the objects itself left the place and how the place have fared since then. Um, in terms of developing, we're interacting with that, uh, these objects and narratives. So I went back and checked why looting was made easy. And the identifiable cause is that um, there were a lot of loopholes, firstly, in how the law, uh, the ancient, Akon Ancient Monuments, Antiquities, Objects of Arts and National Museum in 1961, revised in 1992, uh, scoped um, antiquities as uh, those of Thai origin, which then allows them to be protected from trade and transport not those who that are classified as non-Thai. Now, for objects like Dados or Prakon uh, Chai or Prai Bad Hoard, it leaves a lot of room for discussion. Obviously, back then in like, the 1960s, 1970s, when they were leaving uh, the country, it wasn't so clear. There were writings that claimed that they were from Cambodia. There were writings that claimed that um, they weren't even from, from this mainland, Southeast Asia. And you, you have this kind of confused information, which allows trafficker to kind of go in into this discussion on, on um, uh, allow them to, to actually uh, pass through this framework, whether they're smuggled or not. Um, they're not checked. Secondly, more and more importantly, and likelier the case, the lack of human resource and technical shortages in controlling imports and exports of antiquities. Uh, it leaves a lot of antiquities uh, vulnerable 
rising conflict at that time did not help also. Uh, rural urban divide between heritage management and how heritage is handled. There's also a lot of misconception of heritage management and ownership back then. Um, and it was recently revised. It's still under revision on who controls and who can actually develop heritage sites. So back then and up until uh, recently, in a lot of places where there are archaeological sites, um, local residents are under the impression that if an archaeological site or a significant archaeological site is found, uh, people would, uh, the authorities would come and confiscate their land and everything and take them everything away from them. So it was considered bad even economically, socially, to be living near or within the proximity of um, her, uh, or on heritage sites. Uh, so that, that kind of drives the incentives to destroy these sites. Um, and of course, lastly, problems of corruption and arbitrage, particularly arbitrage in information related to um, archaeological heritage. And this comes even with, obviously, with that heightened demand in Prakun Shai Hoard, um, self and the large international market, small, medium scale buyers, kind of a lower and um, less than sauce to be auctioned houses, started looking for them. And that leaves room for a lot of uh, forgeries to be. Um, so that's kind of the institutional loopholes that we, we work on and in terms of premise of uh, ownership and how people used to think about heritage. Now, repatriation movement in the past used to be academic-led. Um, it's mostly urban uh, academics in uh, with the Narai Lintel. It's really driven by a Bangkok-based group, um, university students. There were real street protests so in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, a lot of the, when a lot of um, that demand was coming out, mainstream media driven. It has to become. Uh, it was. It came out via uh, major newspaper, uh, which is still publishing and has helped publish on uh, this particular social media movement, but they're no longer the center stage of uh, public uh, mass media yeah, like in the past. Now, and in a way, that's because uh, print media and big media companies itself are subjected to clicks. So it's very different from the experience of opening newspapers with multiple columns that you can access nowadays as compare it to accessing news article based that comes up on algorithm based on your interests. So articles are really looking for clickbait contents and the algorithm will drive you towards contents which you have accessed before instead of newer uh, topics. So that's kind of how media has transformed. Now, social media movement, uh, some Nutsam Loifon, uh, took root and really scaled up with uh, a Sostabee's auction of a uh, Bai Bat uh, hoard, uh, as you see there, in 2004. And it started picking up uh, a lot of content. So the contents creator were, were doing this kind of pre uh, 2015 even, it was in, in the early 2000s where they were gathering network um, and they were tracking down where each and um, one of uh, these uh, sculptures are in the world. Um, it was at the same time that a lot of international uh, museums were beginning to digitize their content um, and even in museums that didn't digitize their content, the network was able to co-op in from Thais who lived abroad, who were affiliated to the network. And that feed fed back right into a uh, page, building up a page content. And they formed this group, came to call themselves Sam Nuk Sam Loi Ong, which uh, translate roughly as the conscious towards the 300. So this came from Albert Le Bonheur's uh, estimation of how many sculptures uh, belonging to the Bribat horde uh, that were circulating 
circulating in the market um, after his purchase. Um, he was a curator at Guimet Museum at that time, after that per the Guimet's purchase from Spink and Sons in, in London in 1972. So uh, they, are, they are still trying to track down his collection, both in Thailand and, and abroad. But what, it, what became interesting is that for the first time, this didn't happen out of academics that were based in Bangkok. Neither did it start with academics that are based in major universities. It's an amateur academic, uh, local co-groups, uh, local historians in both Korat and Biburilam and within Blai ba uh, Bakonchai uh, uh, district itself, who were driving uh, this movement. And it was even further what's more interesting is we're driven by the village and community themselves that were living in the area and some of the other figures that have become the head informants and people pushing for the returns of these objects were actually the looters involved within um the the uh the looting that happened in the 1960s and the 1970s um a a volunteer system developed where people were tracking down there were people who that called themselves cyber warriors who went out to track down different um groups uh, uh museums that were were uh housing these these uh collections uh, both in the United States. The, young la uh, the lovely lady you see there on your right panel uh, is kind of, kind of showing her protest, saying they're protesting uh, in front of the, the Met in New York. Uh, and it became a real social uh, media network with connections to uh, with the kind of media outlets, the formal media outlets, kind of following contents that instead of them delivering contents from professional academics in university, uh, they weren't delivered. Uh, it was the opposite. It was delivering these information to them. And it became really amazing because all these old men, um, some in their late 70s, 80s, some in the 90s, were coming out, pointing out where they were finding things, uh, which, what the, the sculptures look like, they were identifying who, uh, the names of the individuals that were purchasing uh, materials uh, from them, uh, the people who have visited them looking, scouting for, uh, for, for information. So this allowed us to, uh, it was possible for them to now with this interaction, which never happened before, usually you have to rely on police reports. Uh, to construct you know, evidence of looting, it was now possible to construct new affidavits uh, for repatriation case based on uh, verbal witnesses, uh, living witnesses that were involved with the case who have records of being arrested for looting the, the site itself. Um, and they uh, integrate, uh, it also allows them to integrate local identity to repatriation, provides checks on usage of heritage upon return, an oral history added to the provenant story that is most than much ignored. And what it did was it allowed um, these collective oral history of what happened during the looting, allowed the local scholars to construct a replica of where everything was uh, based on interviewing different peoples in, in two villages, uh, where, how the, sculpt, the, the temple was set e before its uh, destruction. And that's kind of um, my map of um, those accounts compiled from uh, my interaction with uh, one of the local Santanong Sak Han Wong. What this did, uh, so this movement, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll try to kind of quickly go through this story. Uh, decentralizing heritage, what it lit is that it ref it's a reflection of how heritage governance is becoming decentralized. Now, why? Interest in heritage, I pointed out before that in the 19s, before the millennium, you know, uh, happened, uh, Thailand, and a larger extent the area around Korat was in a different kind of socioeconomic setting. This happened in a wider scale as different countries across Asia are becoming purely more prosperous. The slave rise to more interest in cultural identity, local identity, tea, and definitely heritage consumption. So this aspects of 
wealthier Asia and regional areas then pushes this demand. So you have more government driven uh, local museum initiatives with more than one hour, one more than 1,400 non-state operated museums out across the countries. People been fly by themselves are hoping in Pakonchai are hoping that once these objects return, they will be able to set up a large museum in their area to attract tourists. And of course, partially uh, because the elders really believe that by selling the objects they are cursed for life uh, their families are cursed they are complete they're going to be um, impoverished that interaction of local belief then formulated this push towards demands of ways to um, to repatriate the objects so it's in a way it's a rise of local and patriotism that developed out of this. Moreover, uh, we are also seeing a uh, rise in more kind of national wider media interests in uh, pushing things out like uh, the famous Siri Naki, which became a driver of tourism in Isan area, uh, both from Bangkok and within uh, the, the localities, different provinces itself. So provinces like Buri Ram, where, uh, where Pakun Chai district is situated, have been seeing increasing tourism um, over the past decade. So it's now become the wealthiest province uh, in the area. But at the same time, this new repatriation process creates a tension. You have the state, uh, before you have the state where there's ministries of foreign affair, police authorities, fine arts department, university states academic, controlling the information. Then the students co-opt into driving that passion for, for social movement with the media kind of backing them up. So information is controlled in that sense. With this new group of new repatriation process where it's coming from amateur historians, local historians, immediately you have contention on perspective regarding what defines historicity of objects and places. So social media allows that platform to be delivered where people are defining their own history in that sense. And sometimes that history clashes with what is viewed as formal. So, uh, synchronizing the two, whether through social media publication, local government interest in managing heritage instead of the fine arts department, um, and particularly with the internet now access to international partners for those who can work in English, some of them have taken the initiative to contact authorities in the United States. So it's very interesting. This means the whole repatriation process that used to be five, where you had to formulate the fed of it, uh, submit it, uh, have the embassy submit everything, run through official bodies. This process has been decentralized. So in, you have ongoing challenges uh, on how to streamline um, repatriation process. So without organization in that sense, the social media movement in somewhat way becomes a double-edged sword. While it garnered a lot of internet meet local um, and domestic national interests at its height of social movement, um, it also had huge struggle pushing for centralized repatriation work and body to be done. There are no manpower to actually uh, put everything through re repatriation, which unfortunately is still very state to state process negotiation. So, so that um, problem still continues. On a second level, that tension between formal academics, those who work in the fine arts department, those who work in major universities, those who work as um, public figures, local and intellectual historians operating from local area, this conflicting publication of knowledge between what the page social media publishes and those who are schooled in art and archaeology, it creates a, um, a new scope for debates where debates are diverted instead of discussing repatriation process regardless of copies, forgeries, fakes, or, or problems where, where you normally that sorting out bit comes out later once things goes back to the country of origin. Um, 
it becomes a confusion where straw man arguments emerge um, and it becomes the focus of debate. So a lot of the time, uh, scholars were arguing whether uh, things represented certain religion and it had nothing to do with the repatriation process. So this kind of diffuses the impacts of the social media. It stalled the legal framework and lastly, it created a nasty collective action problem where um, it became a struggle a quick to click process. So so far, it took the efforts uh, by destination. It took efforts by destination countries uh, to check for anti-money laundering and trafficking. That Thailand is getting some objects back. Uh, unfortunately, kind of streamlining, uh, making sure that Prakun Chai Hoard gets returned to Thailand is still a struggle and a process ongoing, which have now. Uh, slowly come is slowly coming together uh, in parts of the government and the local go uh, academics itself. There's a present needs to arrange, rearrange domestic and gener um, generation of knowledge on repatriation frameworks and law, uh, which needs to come at, into the discussion at some point. Uh, at the moment, it's like, why do these museums have these objects? So it's still a very stagnant narrative that's garnered to sensationalism based on the social media itself. Lastly, um, this leaves the question of mitigating for impacts of legacy of centralized heritage control, because whether we like it or not, this type of social movement, this interest, rising interest in cultural heritage that belongs to people in local area will continue to exist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pacha, for your uh, very stimulating, uh, very detailed and, and stimulating presentation. Um, I think you raised some very interesting issues earlier in your presentation about the role of the international art market in particular in designating objects as being, as being valuable. And also very interesting uh, discussions of the impact of um, social media and the importance these days of um, uh, local activism in terms in, in relation to these repatriation requests in, in contemporary Thailand. So it's very interesting to hear about these grassroots movements and it's clearly um, a very different environment to that uh, described by Charlotte in, in Myanmar. So thank you very much for your presentation raising all sorts of issues that I'm sure we can um, discuss um, in the last in the last part of this uh, session, so I'm going to move now on to ask um, Um Odomla Ud to um, respond, if she can, to those two presentations. Over to you. Thank you, Louise. Can you hear me well? Okay. Um, thank you, Charlotte and Hacha, for the fascinating talk. It is interesting to see some similarities between Thai and Myanmar repatriation cases. And first of all, it can be seen that in the Antiquities Act in both countries gives authority to only one institution which is able to manage the national cultural heritage, including ancient monuments and artifacts. And in Myanmar, it is the uh, Department of Archaeology and National Museum. And Thailand is a fine arts department. Therefore, it seems that under this Antiquities Act, the calling for repatriation can only be proceeded from these institutions. And secondly, as the national heritage management in both countries has been centralized by one government authority, as Pacha and Charlotte has, been mentioned, has mentioned this, and defining of the approval of so-called national heritage must be come from this come from them and has to be consistent to the national narrative and therefore in theory monitoring the national heritage that might be illegally brought uh, to other countries is relied on these authorities however uh, due to a uh, lack of resource such as finance technology and stuff it is rarely to see these institutions to be active in doing so so as we can see in that um, returning of the Bagan Buddha images demonstrating in the um, Charlotte article and Banshiang objects that um, described in Melody's article that none of these repatriations started from the central authorities. However, um, 
the case of flyback bronze sculptures discussed in Pacha's articles and she has presented uh, before has suggested a new trend of public awareness and movement toward defining national versus local heritage in the era of social media. In this discussion, I will mainly focus on the context of Thailand and will, um, I think it's related to some point that, we, uh, that Charlotte has pointed out before. Uh, in my opinion, it can be said that reclaiming fly but bronze sculptures has made a significant move for the local people to be aware of their cultural rights and to be able to participate in defining and managing their cultural and even the so-called national heritage. As a request for a returning of the ancient bronze objects was initially driven from the locals, including local scholars and communities, rather than from the central authority, which in this case, the fine arts department. I agree with Pacha in that the social media is one of the main factors that makes the local voices louder and reinforce this movement to be, become more powerful. Uh, however, I would like to point out other two social and political contexts in Thailand that could help us to understand the way how this social movement has been developed. The first, first of all, um, in the 1997 constitution in which the power of central, central government was decentralized and this 1997 constitution clearly states that the local administrations are authorized to safeguard, conserve, and protect the cultural heritage. In addition, the local people could also be participated in these activities. As a result, uh, many of the local people, um, oh, sorry, many of the cultural centers, local museums, provincial and district or even school museums, for example, which run by the local administrations have been increasingly established since the late 1990s. However, the problem is there is no clear definition that this term cultural heritage in the constitution means or includes the national heritage or not. And ironically, in 1961 act of ancient monuments and antiquities, which revised in 1992 has not been revised again to be consistent to this 1997 constitution. Therefore, the fine art department is still the only institution that has authority over the national heritage. And second, apart from the constitution, I would say um, due to the uh, an effect of the modernization and economic development, and since the 1980s, we can see the emergence of new social and cultural phenomena, especially an increasing of cultural nostalgia in various communities across Thailand. Many communities seek to revive, protect, and even create their local or ethnic identities, resulted in revival of the heritage sites, as we can see everywhere of so-called 100 year market, floating market heritage building and so on. In addition, in this period, we can also see an establishment of many private museums. For example, Museum of Ethnic, uh, Museum of Ethnic Group, City Museum, Family Museum, Toy, Folk Museum, and etc. And so we can what we can say about this phenomena, I think it's it signifies of an expansion of public awareness and as being a Thai citizen, and according to the 1997 institution, they have their political and cultural rights to be able to tell what story, narrative and heritage that is significantly meaningful for them and should be a representative from, for themselves or for their communities. And of course, um, they, uh, and of course they should be able to, uh, to have their own rights to participate in the cultural and national heritage management. And in case of some some Nut Samurai or movement, although it started in 2016 by a group of local scholars, and later the movement spread out and participated by the local communities and the, um, and the local authority as well. I was surprised that the bronze sculptures appear at everywhere and in many events, not just in the conferences and seminars that were held in Bangkok, but in the region and 
more interestingly is uh, the seminar was held by the bicycle club in the Playa Bat ancient, Monum ancient monument. As we can see before in Pacha's presentation, the sculptures also appeared in a local religious parade. I think she, she has that, that, that image in, in, in her slide. And there are at least three songs which were written regarding this reclaiming movement. And they were sung in the mini concerts in the region. So we can say that the flyback bronze sculptures are eventually incorporated into local identities. And but up until now, it is unclear that if the flyback sculptures were successfully repatriated to Thailand, where these objects should be kept or displayed, or in terms of object biographies, what story should be associated with these materials? Will the story of local movements be involved in that or just simple, simply says the fine art department successfully brought them back? So although the local communities and authorities have raised this issue among their groups, um, the fine arts department has not been discussed with them yet. But I think um, we will soon be an eyewitness of the negotiation as there is one successful reclaiming test between Thai and the US. It is a stone lintel from the Nong Hong monument and the calling for repatriation started from the local communities. And um, so this come to my, the end of my discussion, the screen returns back to you, Louise. Thank you very much um, for, for your um, cons considerations and your, your commentary. I understand um, that Pacha will now be happy to, to make some comments on, on, on what you've just said, um, followed by Charlotte. Thank you. So I just received a question on um, kind of process, what is going on with uh, law and how is Thailand working to to fill up that uh, loophole? I thank thank um, Dom Lak for her um, wonderful add on. Uh, it's it's also fascinating because we did have a recent television show used that used um, at least what they think is a an image of a uh, Bly Bat. Um, sculptures uh, featured in in kind of the major story plot so it's definitely appearing everywhere but at the same time um i just kind of want to highlight that that this process of you know when you start demanding for repatriation and it reaches this kind of centralized state structure then you're met with this huge wall of how to kind of not just the law work but actually putting the work their fed a bit um all of that into a, a consistent um, case that you submit to uh, countries where where these objects are. So in terms of the, the loopholes itself, Thailand has been looking at ways to revise its, uh, its framework on and approaches on heritage. Unfortunately, it still lacks um, people who can engage with material culture that doesn't belong to what at least the state, the scope of the state knowledge, uh, that they consider it part of Thai art. Uh, so that has been tricky. Um, it's also left a very big gap where you get Chinese material, material from the Middle East, uh, kind of filtering through uh, being auctioned in Bangkok, uh, smuggled into Bangkok and leaving Bangkok. Um, undetected or even with detection people don't really know what to do with them um the cultural people within uh, academia people within the government let alone uh, authorities that are peripherally involved like the police or the customs office so it's really been a challenge in terms of of blocking uh even with the legal framework implementing uh has been a huge issue it's also um thailand has also introduced uh is considering uh, revising its position on the 1970 UNESCO convention. So, but bearing that in mind, uh, even with the convention sign on, it will still cannot use the convention to address anything that goes out before signing on to the convention. So we'll have to still rely on kind of the bilateral street um, agreement and negotiation framework. 
uh, which is uh, on top of that, as I pointed out uh, before, we um, it's still severely lacking kind of the human resource to do that. Just to kind of add a bit on, on the plus side of this um, recent interest and in kind of growing consciousness in, in cultural heritage, um, not only uh, would I like to point out a really good uh, basis for kind of a 1997 constitution. What has built up from there is the 2001 and one act on decentralizing uh, heritage management, which has helped uh, places like uh, certain museums in Lopuri Janssen Museum from organizing their own kind of heritage, working with state and FAD parties to set up uh, these museum collections, um, working with academics as well. But it's also still very limiting. And um, what it has done, interestingly, is that it has pushed the burden of um, kind of curating, not, not, not just curating, but storing and constructing facilities onto local government bodies. So there's a bit of a tension on if uh, the central authorities are custodians of these material and the local bodies are legally borrowing management from uh, these legal custodians in the central authority, then who pays to set up all these facilities, these museums and organization. So that is an ongoing tension. And um, it's unfortunately something that um, while the social media movement can pick up um, and create sensations for people don't like to go into trivial details, which make things, uh, which actually is the important part in uh, materializing large project or development projects. So it's still, you know, the content focus is still very much we want these objects back instead of why don't we have the people uh, working or why don't we have expertise to address a growing uh, looting problem or growing problems in terms of uh, how the FedEx bits themselves, they're very hardly, it's still voluntary basis where people, um, different parties have to go in, volunteer to gather documentations. Um, instead of uh, you have these meetings that keeps going on once, twice per year, discussing repatriation, but no work gets really done in between. So that's still kind of the challenging part and loopholes in the process. Unfortunately, the fine arts department do not have a central authority or people on the desk working purely on repatriation and looking at looting problems. Okay, you're handing over to me now. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks, Patcha. Um, yes, just in response to those comments, um, it's an interesting point looking at the central authority in both countries um, and how that sort of works in practice. And I suppose the highlights for me, which has been for quite some time, of course, is how far behind Myanmar is with um, managing issues to do with hierarchy within government and of course um, and its distance between what's happening on the ground and with the public and I think we are all well aware that you know issues of trust are of um, paramount importance in um, Myanmar and so in terms of heritage management it's such a hierarchical structure um, that even now you know that any position of trying to engage with local people on the ground and trying to generate ideas and interests in what is their heritage but have those voices heard in any sort of central um, arena is really quite difficult. Um, I can't help but sort of look back on some of those early post-independence years where in some of the um, government reporting you know there's a very conscious effort of trying to engage with the very the multitude of you know, ethnicities and in, um, cultures within Myanmar. And within the cultural um, sphere, they were actually starting to map what was happening in terms of cultural activities in the different ethnic areas. Um, unfortunately, of course, um, they're in a situation where they have got a very dominant ethnic group and the Bama, which are over 60% of the population. And so, and in recent years, there's been such a, a, a sort of hiving off of, or even a more, um, you know, I suppose, 
increased gap between trying to understand other people's cultures in a sort of a way we would consider more even handed um, a sort of approach. Um, I think there's areas, um, as I said, it's very patchy across Myanmar. There are areas where people are, are interested in their local heritage. Um, there's some very, um, couple of very active heritage, um, local heritage trusts. Um, but that has really emerged out of um, activities to do with UNESCO, engagement also with sort of international experts who have been supporting activities there. Um, and I did sort of note this idea of like, how do you get things known to, to central government and um, promote some of these ideas of repatriation um, of material that they may well know is overseas or in private hands. And that's, we'll come back to that Q&A question later. Um, and part of this problem here, you know, is again, it's an incredibly hierarchical structure within, and this central point of contract within, contact within the Ministry of Religious Affairs and Culture and the um, Department of um, Archaeology and Museums. Um, that, you know, without that sort of trust building um, and even just the understanding of sort of more established international procedures for these um, activities, it's very difficult still to get local people to engage in what we would consider more contemporary um, heritage practices. Um, just one thing on that new, inter um, the law, the antiquities law they introduced in 2015, they actually are going, paying money to local people who, you know, farmers who dig up objects in fields and, you know, want to hand them over. You can actually hand them over to the government and they will pay you money. Um, that is actually, you know, quite a, a, a really good step forward in a way of trying to stop um, the looting activities. But of course, it's certainly not stopping everything um, happening. And as I said, it really is about this lack of transparency um, that's happening within um, government. Um, I also just feel too, um, with this sort of issue of trust, there's still a lot of fear within um, the people working in these fields. And for them to say, if for someone to suggest an activity to do with repatriation, the you know, political implications, if it didn't work or it caused trouble with a, another country, that fallout does come back down on that poor person who started it rather than anyone else up the chain taking responsibility. So there's an awful lot of um, work to be done. Um, and I'm really interested to hear what's happening in Thailand because you know, that will slowly filter through um, uh, to neighbouring Myanmar, but they said they've got a long way to go. Thanks very much, Charlotte, for your comments. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, we've only got uh, five or so minutes left, and we have a, um, a question in the Q&A box, which I think you were quite happy uh, to respond to. It's from Jessica Wiseman and it's um, to Charlotte and it says, what is your perspective on the private collections that exist in Myanmar, which include many objects acquired illegally? I'm thinking particularly about the collection of U Kin Shui, which is, or at least was, in the process of being legitimized as a museum. Is there any value in advocating for internal repatriation from elite collectors back to the communities from which these objects were taken? And do you see any risks in legitimizing such collections? Yes, this is um, this has actually been a subject of um, quite a lot of debate. And I think there are people on sort of either sides. I mean, I'm aware of, the, I know this, I've seen this collection, um, uh, Kin Shui, who's very, you know, made a lot of money in Myanmar. Um, he's built this amazing museum. Uh, and yet it's a really a conundrum because under the current, uh, they, they said this 2015 law, he could be, he's legally meant to be um, declaring all of the objects he has that might be over a hundred years old. Um, they're meant to be registered um, with the state and any transfer of ownership to somebody else is possible, but you have to register that transfer and indicate how much you're paying for those objects. Um, our concern has always been that the person who will first get prosecuted under these acts is going to be the local antique dealer um, and not someone like um, uh, Kin Shui. And that is only going to also reinforce um, this lack of trust within um, administration and authority. Um, in terms of what you do with these collections, the infrastructure within Myanmar cannot cope with the material. Um, he's actually managed to put together, you know, team it's of people who are have been um, trained overseas um, they run it's being run as a sort of 
a really good private museum. Um, it is transparent in that sense, you know, there's access to collections. I mean, he's run runs tours um, for the public. So there is a level of degree of accountability there that that material is known and it is available for people to see. Um, I suppose the, um, you know, and he has the flexibility to create a, a museum and displays without all of the bureaucra bureaucratic um, he um, headaches that go with um, Myanmar's professional uh, uh, pub public institutions. Um, Honestly, it's it's just I won't even can't even begin to go in with them um, to some of the difficulties and getting simple things done um, within those systems. Um, so I think it is at the moment within the Myanmar system there is a place for something like this, providing that transparency is there, um, because he has the resources to look after the collections well in a way, honestly, that the public system doesn't. Thanks very much for that, Charlotte. I think we are running now out of time and we probably need to, to wrap up. Um, so it just remains for me to say a huge thank you to our speakers today for their contributions, for their very stimulating contributions. And also to thank everybody who's asked questions today and also the audience um, in general for attending. Thanks very much and uh, goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.